Uh, so I'm going to give a lecture on uh, how genome assembly works, uh, go over some of the theory behind it, how we assemble uh, genomes from short and long reads, uh, then we'll have a coffee break, come back, and uh, you'll work through a lab where you'll, where you'll actually get to assemble a small genome using some PacBio and Illumina data. Uh, so there's a lot of different ways of, of presenting sort of a high-level picture of assembly. Here's how I like to think of it. Um, we have a genome. We chop up many copies of the genome into fragments. We then sequence those fragments. And the process of genome assembly is just since you're reversing the sequencing pro process and stitching together the original genome from those reads that we've sampled. Um, people have used different analogies of, you know, putting together a puzzle without being able to know what the puzzle actually looks like or cutting up a bunch of newspapers. One that I'll use is, let's say I grab all the binders off your desks with the course materials. I take them to the paper shredder, shred it up into pieces, dump it on the floor, and say, reconstruct the pages uh, that's in this binder. You'd be quite mad at me, but you'd get a better uh, understanding of what an assembly is. Now, the key things here are that if we, uh, if I shred that into really tiny pieces, you'd have a lot of leftover white pieces that give you no information of how they go together. Those are the repeats in the genome where we just don't have enough information from, say, short reads to assemble them back together. Conversely, if I chopped it up into very large fragments, just each page into three or four pieces, you'd have a lot of information to stick those pages back together and be relatively easy to, to, uh, to assemble. So the talk's going to have three parts. Uh, I'll give you an overview of how assemblers work, a little bit of the theory behind it. Uh, then I'll talk about assembly albums for short and long reads. So that is two distinct parts because the methods that we use for short read assembly, like Illumina reads, are completely different than the methods we use for long reads. Uh, they're all based on the same underlying theory, which I'll present first, uh, but I'll give you, you know, a view of what uh, the assembly pipelines for the different problems look like. Uh, and then finally, in the third part, which is going to lead into the practical session, I'm going to talk about uh, what type of properties or features of a genome make short read assembly difficult and how we can measure that beforehand using uh, some software that my group develops. Okay, so again, here's a view of how assembly works. We have an input, which is our genome sequence, which is shown up in here in red. Is my pointer working? Yes, kind of shown up in here in red. We take many copies of that genome. We then fragment it into pieces and then read each one of those individual pieces using uh, the DNA sequencers that I introduced to you yesterday. Now we call this process whole genome shotgun sequencing. The shotgun meaning that we randomly fragment the genome. We don't know where the pieces came from in the genome. We just blow up the genome, sequence each one of these fragments, then we need to put it back together. And this is a term that goes back since the Human Genome Project when they talk about shotgun methods of genome assembly. Now if we knew where every one of these reads came from in the genome, if we knew that this read here down at the bottom is the leftmost read, or it covers the first base through to the 15th base of the genome, we knew that this read is, starts at the fifth base and so on, it would be really easy to do the reconstruction. We could just merge all of these sequences along uh, the genome to, to stitch it back together. So we'd start with this read, merge it with this one, which adds that CG base, merge it with this one, which adds GC, TCT, AGG, and so on, just walking along these ordered fragments until we've reconstructed a whole genome. Now the difficulty comes in that we don't actually know where the reads came from. We don't have this total ordering of the reads. We only have their read sequences, and then we need to computationally infer what the order of those reads were uh, on the original genome. And unlike when uh, in the other practical sessions that you've done where you've mapped the reads to a reference genome, which give you this ordering or an approximation of this ordering, uh, in de novo genome assembly, we don't know anything about the genome. We only have this set of reads. We need to look at the reads and try to figure out how to reconstruct the sequence. Uh, so this is uh, one of the key terms in genome assembly is the idea of coverage. Coverage has probably come up uh, in, in the other practicals, but I'll just reiterate what we think of it in, in assembly. And this is the average number of reads that's covering any position in the genome. 
So if in our read sequences, which are shown in blue here, we have 177 nucleotides total, and our genome length is 35 nucleotides, our average coverage is 177 divided by 35, which is about 7x, or what we say 7x coverage. What we mean by that is each base of the genome should be covered by around 7 reads. Uh, another way to look at coverage is it can refer to the number of reads covering a particular position in the genome. So the coverage of this T here is 6, as 6 of these blue reads cross this T position. Now when you're doing a genome assembly, coverage is an incredibly important thing to consider. Uh, to assemble the genome, we need a lot of redundancy between our read set. We need reads that overlap each other that we can uh, compare to each other to say that they might have come from the same region of the genome. And to ensure that reads overlap, we need to redundantly oversample the genome. We need to sequence it to 30, 40, 50 X coverage to make sure that we have enough overlapping reads that we can walk across this whole sequence. Uh, the coverage requirements is a really common question I get. Someone will come to me and say, uh, I want to assemble this genome. How much sequence? How many aluminum lanes do I need to put towards it? Or how many nanopore flow cells? Um, and it depends on the size of the genome, how repetitive, repetitive it is, how much, what sequencing technology you use. But typically, we aim for something between 30 to 50x coverage uh, to get a good assembly. OK, uh, so the basic principle of assembly is that if we compare any two pairs of reads, Reads that might have come from the overlapping positions of the genome, so the same location on the genome, should be quite similar to each other in their sequence. We should be able to find reads where the end of the read or the suffix of the read is similar to the prefix or the beginning of another read. So if we look at this example here, we have our genome sequence in red. This read started from this position. This read started from this position. Uh, and they share this overlap of about maybe, say, 15 bases here. So they're very similar in their sequence. And we can find that suffix of one read that matches a prefix of another. And this gives us some bit of information about what the genome sequence might be. Uh, so I mentioned in the intro that we use different assembly strategies for short and long reads. Uh, I'm going to talk about long read assembly approaches first. So as, as I introduced yesterday, uh, long reads are produced by the Pacific Biosciences Instrument and the Oxford Nanopore Sequencer. We can get reads that are in excess of 10,000 bases, that's quite common, uh, but they have a much higher error rate of 5 to 15 percent. And the key computational challenge and the thing that labs like mine work on are trying to overcome this high error rate uh, in the sequencing data. Now, on the other hand, short read sequencing, which we've heard about throughout the course from Illumina, is very high accuracy, less than 1% error rate, and very high throughput. So you can get a lot of short 100 base pair reads. Uh, the drawback of Illumina sequencing, which I've touched on before, is the short read length uh, limits our ability to resolve repeats. Um, and the key computational challenge is just being able to efficiently deal with this massive amount of sequencing data that Illumina produces. Yeah. Are those 30x and 50x sort of typical coverage guidelines are they different from the long reads and the short reads? Because you would think longer reads you need to get them faster. Yeah. The, yes, it's, it's a very good question and very insightful about the long reads. You, to cover the genome and have long enough overlaps, you can get away with, with shallower coverage for long read sequencing. But because you have a higher error rate, to get accurate base calls at the end, you need more coverage to... Uh, to go into your consensus model, which we're going to talk about uh, later. So for to get the same, say, overlap percentage, you can get away with shorter, co uh, shallower coverage with long reads, but that's the trade-off is that you'd have a lower consensus accuracy. So you get the same quality of assembly plus confidence that reads end up meeting about the same amount? Yeah. We usually, like, for nanopore uh, assembly, I, I suggest at least 50x, 100x is, is better just because the, the error rate is so high and the error rate is particularly biased towards difficult sequence motifs. Um, and you need statistical power from many, many reads at each base to get over that, uh, those biases. With packed bio, you can get pretty good assemblies between 25 and, and 50x. We, we did a, uh, an assembly of the Canadian beaver genome with 25x for packed bio. Is a point of national pride to do that. Um, and we were able to get away with, with a bit lower coverage there. But we also use Illumina data then to correct some of the errors that we, we, we weren't able to fix with the PacBio reads alone. Um, 
for luminous sequencing, we're, the method that we're going to talk about is, is based on brown graphs, which use k-mers, and you want to sequence really deeply to have, be able to use long k-mers to get around these repeat problems. So the coverage thing is incredibly, like I could give an entire lecture on just coverage considerations and the different trade-offs. Um, but yeah, they're di it's different between the short and long reads. Uh, mainly, mainly the trade-off is between overlap length and accuracy. Uh, right, so the key computational in, in challenge for Illumina sequencing is just uh, co making your software and your algorithms computationally efficient enough that it's going to complete the assembly in a reasonable amount of time. Okay, so um, the methods that are used for long reads really have uh, an origin of assembling uh, Sanger sequencing data, which we talked about yesterday. Um, so the very first genomes were essentially assembled by hand by comparing the these gel images. Uh, you could do that for a uh, viral genome, but when larger and larger genomes were sequenced with Sanger, uh, computational or software-based assemblers were developed. Uh, and the dominant paradigm was called overlap layout consensus assembly, or OLC. Um, since short read sequencing took over, but now long read sequencing is, is, is becoming popular again, OLC-based assembly has seen a resurgence. And the main assemblers uh, for long reads, like PAC Biodata, are all based on this, this idea. Uh, so OLC assemblers uh, take in your sequencing reads as input. They first find overlaps between reads and construct an overlap graph. They then process that overlap graph to compute a layout of the reads, which is this ordering of the reads along the genome. They then calculate a consensus sequence at the end to overcome this high error rate, and then they uh, output contigs uh, as their uh, output. And a contig here is uh, a stretch of the genome that was assembled into uh, one piece. It's short for a contiguous sequence. So it's a sequence of reads that had all their sequences merged together into some segment of the genome. So I'm going to talk about each one of these stages uh, in, uh, in turn here. So as I mentioned earlier, we have this unordered set of reads, and we want to figure out relationships between the reads, which reads may have come from the same uh, location of the genome. The way that we do this is we take pairs of reads, we use dynamic programming, which is a way of, of performing string comparisons, and we look for significant overlaps between the reads. So the overlap has to be at least a certain length, let's say for a thousand base pair uh, pack bio read, the overlap length might have to be 500 bases with few mismatches or insertions and deletions. So here's an example of a small, uh, short pair of reads that overlap with one mismatch in the middle. But you can see there's a lot of, uh, the, the identity between the two reads is fairly high. Um, so when constructing our overlap graph, we'll create a vertex in the graph, which is depicted by one of these circles for each one of our reads. And when we find one of these significant overlaps between a pair of reads, we connect them up with an edge. Now for early Sanger sequencing data where we didn't have that many reads, you maybe have a few thousand reads for your sequencing project. Uh, you could just take every pair of reads in your sequence collection, compare them to each other, look for an overlap. If they have it, great, put an edge in the graph. Uh, when you assemble human genome-sized uh, data sets with overlap-based methods, there's just too many pairs of reads to exhaustively compare all of them. So groups like mine develop ways of very efficiently screening for the pairs of reads that might actually have an overlap. Uh, and the algorithms we use are quite similar to the mapping and alignment algorithms that uh, you heard about earlier uh, in the course. So at the end of this, we, we get an overlap graph. So an overlap graph is just a graph where every read is a vertex. So the, the reads that we had on the previous slide are a vertex in here. So we had one read GCA, TTA, one read ATT, so on. In each one of those is a read, and those are the vertices of the graph. For all of the reads that had a significant overlap, we've connected them up with an edge here. Now, it's the assembler's task to find a path or a walk through this graph, so the path that visits each one of these nodes uh, that reconstructs the original genome sequence. Now, just looking at this graph, it's, it's a little bit complicated. We couldn't tell exactly what the genome sequence is just by looking at the structure of the graph. So the assembler has to work a little bit harder and try to figure out what the true path through the graph is that reconstructs the genome from all the possible paths uh, that you could take through this graph. 
So that's the job of the second stage of the assembler, what's called the layout stage, which is going to bundle stretches of the overlap graph uh, into these contiguous sequences or contigs. So I'm going to turn to uh, an example of reconstructing a fragment from a song. This is uh, the fragment is to everything, turn, 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 there is a season. And the reason we've, we've selected this to demonstrate assemblies, there's a repeat in here. This, this word turn is present three times. Now, if we fragment this sentence into a lot of different copies with about five character words and construct an overlap graph uh, from those words, it looks like this. It's pretty nasty. We don't really see what the reconstruction uh, is by walking through this graph. So what the assembler is going to do is it's going to examine the graph and try to figure out whether some of all of these edges in the graph are necessary. And uh, overlap layout consensus assembly is based on the idea that a lot of these edges in the graph uh, are redundant in that they'll spell the same uh, sentence uh, as another uh, path through the graph. So as an example, we have a series of blue edges here that go from this node to ever, and then O every to every. And the sequence spelled by this path is the exact same as this sequence spelled by this path that bypasses this middle vertex. So in assembly language, we say that this edge can be transitively inferred from the other edges, this green one, and therefore its presence in, is redundant in the graph. So what the assembler does is removes all these transitively inferable edges, starting from edges that bypass a single vertex. So edges that have this pattern where it goes from here all the way over and skips some middle vertex are going to be eliminated from the graph. So let's do that now. We get a graph that's much more simple in structure after doing that transitive reduction. Now if we take that one step further and we eliminate edges that skip two vertices, so uh, these type of transitive edges, we get again get a graph that's even simpler. And now we have these segments in our graph that are unbranched uh, chains where there's no ambiguity. What the assembler then does is build contigs from these unbranched chains in the graph. So the first contig would be to everything turn, and then the second contig over here is turn, there's a season, and then this structure here is an unresolvable repeat as we don't know how many times we should put the word turn into our output sentence. So the assembler would stop at that uh, unresolved repeat and just output these two contigs as the assembly. We haven't assembled the full thing, but we've done a pretty good job. We've gone all the way up uh, to where we had this repeated unit where we couldn't resolve how many copies of the repeat there are. The final step of uh, overlap layout consensus assembly is picking the most likely nucleotide sequence for each contig. So uh, we're using overlap layout consensus assembly for noisy long reads like PacBio and Octred Nanopore. And we need to find, we need to develop an algorithm that will uh, eliminate the errors in the sequencing reads. The way that we do that is we make what's called a multiple alignment, where we take every read that makes up one of our contigs and we line up the bases so that uh, the first base of every contig, uh, every read is lined up, then the second base of every read is lined up, and so on. And then we walk from left to right and pick the most frequent base at each one of these contig, uh, each, each one of these columns, and that's what we call the consensus or the majority. Uh, base at that position. So this first column is completely ambigu unambiguous. There's five T's here. This one's un unambiguous. It's five A's, five G's. This one, there was a sequencing error where there was a deletion at this read. So we have four A's, one deletion. So the consensus nucleotide here is A. Let's keep walking along. Here we had four C's, one T. The consensus is a C. Here we had four C's, one gap, four G's, one C, and over here we had uh, four gaps and one A, so we infer that this A here is an, uh, an erroneous insertion of an A in this read, and we'd output the consensus as a gap character here, which then, which then would be removed. So we're just walking along the sequence, taking the most frequent base uh, at every position. Now this is how old Sanger sequencing uh, consensus algorithms worked. For the very noisy PacBio and Oxford Nanopore data, uh, we use more sophisticated methods, which 
uh, build generative probabilistic models of the underlying raw data, whether it's being these current traces from octave nanopore data or these uh, light pulses in PAC bio data. And then we infer what the true sequence is using these generative probabilistic models, uh, which improve accuracy quite a lot, but are very, very expensive to run. Okay, so overlap layout consensus assembly was developed for Sanger sequencing. When we first got Illumina sequencing, the natural thing to do was take our old OLC assemblers uh, and try to run them on Illumina data. Uh, unfortunately, this profoundly failed because the reads were just too short. The very first Illumina reads, uh, and it was still the Selexa company when, when I uh, got involved, that I saw were about 27 base pairs in length. If you think about trying to calculate an overlap between 27 base pair reads, you're looking at, at an overlap of about 18, 19, maybe 20 bases. This is, there's very many repeated 20 mers in the human genome, and any of the reads that cross over these 20 mers are going to have edges between them, which are just spurious edges between different copies of the repeat. Uh, so if you try to construct an overlap graph of 27 base pair reads for a human genome, you'd have this graph that has billions and billions, probably hundreds of billions of edges, billions of vertices, it wouldn't fit into memory, your assembler would crash, uh, and, and you'd have a very bad time. So what people developed were methods that were overlap free. They didn't want to have to compute pairwise overlaps between Illumina reads. Uh, so the field settled on a technique which is called uh, de Brown graph based assembly, which uses short cameras. Uh, prior to building the, the assembly graph, uh, a requirement of doing the Brown graph based assembly is uh, doing error correction on the reads. So rather than tolerating sequencing errors by allowing inexact overlaps, we're going to pre-process the reads first to find where the errors might be and then correct them to the true genomic base. And then that makes our assembly task a lot easier later on. Uh, I'm going to come back to this figure later. Uh, it shows the error rate for six different data sets, um, Illumina data sets, and it's just here to show you what the error profile of Illumina reads look like. Uh, where the in error rate increases from the five prime to the three prime end up to around uh, a few percent at the very last base. Now, error correction uh, is one of the major problems with, with uh, short read assembly, and people have worked uh, very hard to develop a computationally efficient methods to uh, error correct Illumina reads. Uh, these are all based on counting the number of times k or windows of length k occur across our entire data set. So to walk you through an example, let's consider a read that has a single error. Let's say this c was miscalled by the base caller. Um, the way the error corrector is going to work is it's going to take a k length, let's say 20, count the number of times the first 20 mer in the read occurred across your entire data set, then count the number of times the second, third, fourth, all the way to the last camera in your read, and you're going to compare the counts as you go across the length of the read. Now, the cameras that don't uh, contain sequencing errors, that are true genomic sequence, they should be present in very high copy number, depending on how much sequencing depth you acquired. So if you have 30x sequencing coverage and you have a very low error rate, you should have around 30 cameras that contain uh, that particular sequence. Uh, now, if you have a sequencing error, the sequencing errors are quite rare, it's going to flip a base in true genomic sequence to something that's never been seen before. So the count, the number of times that camera is seen across your entire read set should be very low. It should probably only be one, maybe seen a couple times if it's a recurrent sequencing error. So the idea here is that we can use this camera count as a proxy for the number of times these bases are seen across our entire data set, and we're going to switch the ones that are low frequency to sequences that are high frequency to fix errors. So that's said down here, we're going to look for rare camers, camers that are only seen once or twice across our read, and then flip them to correct them to common camers uh, to make our corrections. Now, the benefit of doing it this way is that camera-based error correction is incredibly fast and memory efficient. You can error correct uh, an Illumina data set for human genome in a few hours using uh, one of the state-of-the-art programs like BFC, whereas if you try to calculate overlaps between uh, Illumina reads that allowed mismatches, uh, it would take 
you know, orders of magnitude longer, and it wouldn't be practical, practical for very large data sets. Okay, so once we've performed our error correction step, we then want to build this to Brown graph uh, and use it to extract contigs. So the de Brown graph is also based on Kamers, and the idea here is that we're going to break our reads into shorter fragments of a uniform length, which would, which is what we call K, and then we're going to construct a graph of the Kamer relationships uh, shown in the reads. So here's an example. We have five reads here. The first one's C C G T T A. We're going to take the first four base pair subsequence which is CCGT, and we're going to put that Kamer into our de Brown graph down here. We're then going to take the second Kamer in this read, CGTT, we're going to put it into our graph here. And now because the Kamer CCGT is followed by CGTT in some read, we link them up with an edge. So this is trying to, to get across the same idea of overlap assembly, where the overlaps represent sequences that might have come been adjacent in our original genome. These edges between Kamers are representing Kamers that might be adjacent in our original genome. So if we do this process, so we just keep extracting all this, the Kamers from these reads, adding them into uh, the graph as vertices and linking them up by edges, we end up with this graph here. Now this graph uh, is fairly simple in structure, but it does have one branching point. Because of this Kamer, CGTT, uh, is repeated in our genome. So it's followed by GTTA at one position and GTTC at another position. Now because this graph is simple, there is a unique reconstruction of the genome where we just walk from here down through this lower branch, back around, visit this ver vertex a second time, and then go up here. And that's the assembly uh, of this little simulation uh, genome. But the nice idea of this, this to Brown graph based assembly is that all you're doing is taking Kamers from your reads, these fixed linked strings, and linking up adjacent Kamers. So this graph can be constructed in linear time uh, in the size of your input data set, and it can be uh, very efficiently implemented using things like hash tables, um, which is what allowed Illumina sequencing reads to be assembled uh, using this technique. And there's been a tremendous amount of work about building faster and more memory efficient to Brown graph based assemblers. Uh, and that's actually what I worked on for my PhD. Right, so after we've constructed our graph, we need to uh, do some post-processing of the graph to get rid of any sort of artifacts that we found uh, in our sequences. So the main artifact are residual sequencing errors that our error correction algorithm wasn't able to remove. So what happens is if we construct a de Brown graph, let's say of these three reads, if there's an error at the end of one of the reads, it causes these spurs off the graph where there's some Kamers that are uh, that diverge from the graph but don't really go anywhere. They stop at some position. Uh, so we have a couple Kamers, uh, a couple nodes here from read two, a couple nodes here from read three, and we call these tips or spurs off of the graph. Now the reason that they just branch off and don't go anywhere is because the, the errors tend to be random unique and at the end of reads. So these, there's no Kamers that contain uh, this A base in the first position of the Kamer, so you don't have these as well-connected things that go back into the graph. They're just these little tips uh, that don't really go anywhere. If you're sequencing a diploid genome and you have heterozygous SNPs, that can cause what we call bubbles in the graph, uh, which are divergences uh, in the structure. So if you imagine all of the Kamers for this allele, where there's this heterozygous CG SNP here, all of the Kamers before the SNP and all of the Kamers after the SNP are common between the two alleles, and that gives rise to this common gray structure here, then the Kamers that cover one of the two alleles diverge, causing this split where one path represents allele 1, one path represents allele 2, and then they come back together once uh, the, the divergent base has worked its way out of the Kamer back into this common sequence. So these are two very common structures that you find in uh, de Brown assembly graphs, and getting rid of them uh, is what allows a de Brown graph assembler to construct very long contigs uh, from short reads. So here's a cartoon of how the, these graph cleaning steps 
improve, improve our de Brown graph. So let's say this is our input graph here. It's quite messy. It's not really clear what the genome sequence is. We'll first make a pass by identifying all of the one uh, side connected vertices in the brown graph. These are nodes that only have an edge in one direction, not coming out. Um, we'll then walk those edges back until they rejoin the main part of the graph. When they do, we'll annotate them as being a tip or a spur and then we'll get rid of them, giving us a much cleaner graph. We'll then walk through the graph looking for these divergent structures where there's a branch point that then comes back together. We then select one of the two alleles to represent uh, the sequence in the genome, remove the other one, giving us a much cleaner structure uh, that looks like this. Now this is looking a bit like our overlap layout consensus graph where we have these long uh, unbranched segments of the genome that can be compacted together into context. And that's exactly what the brown graph assembler does. So yeah. You would select it based on frequency? You usually, uh, what you'll usually do is you'll, you'll calculate the Kamer coverage along each branch mm -hmm. and pick the one with higher coverage. Yeah. Yes. Um, it's an arbitrary decision. Usually it should be 50-50, the ratio. It doesn't really matter. The assembler doesn't care which allele it puts in there. It just wants to put one of the two in there. Um, you can get these bubble structures from sequencing errors that occur right in the middle of a read. And that's why we pick the higher frequency one. Because if you have 30 coverage on one half, one coverage on the other, the one coverage is probably a sequencing error and you want to get rid of that one. Okay, so the assembler is then going to take this much cleaned up graph, compact the nodes together into context. And that's just merging all of these unbranched segments uh, into, into the final genome assembly. So it's going to, going to ignore the places where the graph branches and just compact everything else together. Okay, so we've heard about paired end reads. Um, the final step of uh, short read assembly is leveraging the paired end information to try to jump over these repeats that stop the content assembly. So if you have long insert paired end information, you can map your reads back to your contigs and then keep assembling 500 base pairs downstream after the other pair continues. So the first step is to take our contigs that we produced in the last uh, stage, map our paired end reads to these contigs. So we're going to have paired end reads that map internally on the contigs, which are shown in black bars here, linked by a line. But we're also going to have overhanging pairs where one half of the pair maps to the end of the contig, and the other half of the pair maps to the end of some other contig. So we can infer that in the genome, this contig might be followed by this contig here. Likewise, this contig might be followed by this contig. Now we can formalize this idea by constructing a scaffold graph where we, can, we put a contig as a vertex in the graph, link up a pair of contigs with an edge if there's pairs supporting uh, those two contigs as being linked together. And then we post-process that scaffold graph to construct our scaffolds uh, which are just an ordering of our contigs with gaps in between them where the gaps are the sequences that we can't resolve. Either they're too repetitive or uh, we don't have enough coverage there. So our scaffolds contain gaps. We fill in the sequence between the contigs with N, or the ambiguous nucleotide code. Uh, and some assemblers uh, take the approach where they'll try to use local assembly to fill in the gaps. So they'll do a less stringent assembly of the reads that have pairs in this region to try to fill in uh, that more repetitive sequence. Um, there's some programs out there that will take in other sequencing data like low coverage pack bio data to try to fill in the gaps between uh, your scaffolds as well. So what can you expect the output of an assembler to give you? Well, it varies quite a lot depending on what your uh, the size of the genome you tried to assemble and the type of sequencing data that you had. So for bacterial genomes, uh, a short read assembly will give you hundreds of contigs with an average size of between say 10,000 and 100,000 bases. With long reads like PacBio or Nanopore, uh, it's typical to have the genome in only a handful of contigs, maybe one to five. With most genomes, I'd say being able to be completely assembled into uh, one piece. You get a complete genome assembly. 
For large genomes, uh, with short reads, your context sizes, you can expect to be around 10,000 bases. Uh, for long reads, they'll be around a megabase uh, in size. Uh, long read data, as I mentioned yesterday, is much more expensive. So the right question or the right technology to use depends on your question, what you're interested in getting out of your genome assembly, and also the budget, how much money you can put uh, towards the assembly. I typically recommend that people use uh, long reads if they're assembling very large genomes. If they want to make a new reference genome of some crop that they're interested in, try to use long reads. It'll give you a much higher quality reference um, if you're able to pay for it. Okay, I'm going to switch gears now. Is there any questions at this point about sort of the theory behind assembly? Uh, Chambers, uh, the double strand, just refer to sequence of double strand DNA, or just single direction? Uh, yeah, this is one of these, like, ugly bits of implementing a genome assembler that are hard to deal with. Usually with this vertex um, that has the Kamer sequence is both the Kamer and its reverse complement. Um, because as, as, you, as you know by asking this question, like every sequencing read could have come from either strand. So we want to be able to incorporate that information. The other, some assemblers will have slightly different representations. Well, they'll have sort of these mirrored graphs where there's uh, one set of camers for one orientation, one set of camers for the other, but that gets pretty complicated to implement. So usually assemblers will just represent them both in the same vertex. Yeah. Yeah, so we're... It's a very good question. Structure variation, I think, is, is the best application right now. Um, there are other types of variation that are very difficult to call with the Lumina sequencing. Uh, indel calling, even calling short insertions and deletions of a few bases, is notoriously difficult, especially for somatic mutations. Um, there's a lot of, if you sequence a genome, let's say my genome, and you compared it to the reference genome, you'd find something like five megabases of sequence that's not present in the reference at all. Obviously, if you're not doing de novo assembly, you have no information of the function of that sequence. So it's a combination of structure variation, short insertions and deletions, and novel sequence that gives you the benefit of, of assembly for human genomes. Okay, so the last part of the talk, I'm going to discuss some of the difficulties of uh, performing short read assembly and how we can make predictions about how hard or easy uh, a given assembly will be just from your set of sequencing data. So short read assembly algorithms were an incredibly active area of research between about 2010 to 2015. Um, and there are a lot of community projects to benchmark how well short read assembly uh, software worked. And one of them was called the Assemblathon in Assemblathon 2, which sequenced the genome of three uh, species. One was a boa constrictor, one was a uh, Lake Malawi cichlid, a fish, and one was a parakeet. Um, they didn't know the genomes of these sequences. They released the, the read sets for these three genomes publicly. Everybody who was interested in doing an assembly would t download the data assembled it, submitted it to the organizers, and they benchmarked how well the individual software performed. Uh, my group took part in that, um, along with about probably a dozen other groups uh, around the world. And then the results were, were somewhat disconcerting as the, <laughs> the results were very variable. Um, some assemblers that did very well, say on the snake genome, didn't do very well on the Lake Malawi cichlid. Um, some genomes just performed much, much better for all assemblers than other genomes. So this got me thinking about what makes a given assembly difficult and how can we help you guys, the users, figure out once we've sequenced something, is this going to be an easy genome to assemble or is this going to be a very hard genome to assemble? So I spent about a year working on a program uh, called PreQC, which will take a set of sequencing reads and tell you whether you know, you're in for a hard time during your assembly project. I'm sorry for that. Um, okay, so I sat down, I made a list of what, what features of a genome make assembly difficult. Something I've, I've hammered on about uh, for the last 40 minutes is repetitive sequence. This is an obvious one. Uh, high heterozygosity. If you have very high rate of heterozygous SNPs and indels of your genome, you're going to have a lot of these bubble structures which can confuse the assembler. 
if you didn't sequence enough, maybe you didn't, uh, you didn't have an accurate estimate of your genome size and you only have 15x sequencing coverage, this is going to make the assembler's job a lot more difficult. If you have very biased sequencing coverage, um, and by that I mean your sequencing coverage is very poor for low or high GC content sequences, that causes a lot of problems. Classic example um, is the, uh, the parasite that causes malaria, Plasmodium falciparum, which has 80% AT. This is awful for luminous sequencing. You, it's very, very difficult to get uniform, good coverage of plasmodium for uh, alumina. But because it's so important biologically, people really, really want to sequence and assemble it, uh, the genome. So the assemblers have to try to account for this, but it is one of the factors that makes assembly more difficult. High error rate in your reads, that one's a bit obvious. If you have more, more errors, it's going to be more difficult to, uh, to assemble. If your reads are chimeric, where they contain uh, non-adjacent biological sequence, this confuses the assembler. If you have a lot of sequencing adapters in your reads, if your sequencing center contaminated the sample with something else, or if you simply can't get enough DNA from the organism, so you've taken multiple individuals from the population, you've sequenced them, now you've increased the amount of variation in that sample, uh, that makes the assembler's job a lot more difficult as well. So the way this pre-QC program works is it, it's going to look at the structure of the assembly graph and try to label each one of the branches it's seen with the cause of that branch, whether it's caused by a sequencing error, whether it's caused by a heterozygous SNP, or whether it's caused by uh, a repeat. And the way that it's going to do that is it's going to go back to these methods that we talked about for error correction, where it's going to look at how many times each one of these KMERS occurs across our sequencing data set. Now the first output of this program, and you're going to have a look at these reports in the lab practical coming up next, is uh, a histogram of the KMER, in this case 51 MER, count distribution. Now this is an extremely clean example, and this is what we hope to see when we run a genome assembly. We have this nice peak around uh, KMER count of 30, which is roughly corresponding to 30x coverage. We have a peak over here of KMERS that are only seen a single time. These are KMERS that contain uh, sequencing errors. And you see there's a little shoulder here, which are KMERS that are half the coverage of the main peak, which are KMERS that cover heterozygous SNPs, those ones that cause bubbles in the graph. Now, if we look at this, I'm immediately horrified when I look at this, <laughs> as it's a bimodal distribution. Now the reason it's bimodal, this is from an oyster genome, is that the heterozygous SNP rate in this oyster is roughly about 1%. There's a SNP every 100 bases. So what happens is you get this huge peak of KMERS at half coverage, which correspond to KMERS covering heterozygous SNPs. These are homozygous KMERS, these are heterozygous KMERS. Now no assembler, <clears throat> okay, very few assemblers are designed to deal with this level of heterozygosity. And the authors of the Oyster Genome paper actually started with a short read assembly approach. They saw that this was a heterozygosity and they gave up and used long reads instead. So if you see something like this, it, it's going to be a very difficult genome assembly. So going one step further, um, within pre-QC we have a statistical model which will classify each one of these branches. Now, I'm not going to go into the details of how the statistical model works. It's essentially measuring the coverage between the three vertices uh, that are caused by this branch and comparing the, the coverage of these ones, which are labeled CA and CB. So the idea here is that if it's a sequencing error, we expect one of the branches to have much better coverage than the other. If it's a heterozygous SNP, we expect the branches to have roughly balanced coverage. If it's a sequencing repeat, we expect the branches um, to have coverage which is corresponding to their copy number in the genome. So the output of this that the user can see is a prediction of how often the graph branches due to heterozygous SNPs. And this is the, the uh, plot I'm, I'm showing here. Now this oyster genome that I just not told you was horrible to assemble has a heterozygous SNP branch prediction of about 1 in 100, which matches what we know. The human genome is about one in a thousand, shown in blue here. A negative control here is a haploid yeast genome, which has a heterozygous branch rate of about one in, I think, 30,000 bases, which is the, the, um, 
false positive prediction rate of this approach. Um, so these are the, the, the different assemblathon genomes are listed here. This is the cichlid, the fish in green, the boa constrictor in red, the parakeet in purple, and their difficulty of assembly roughly corresponds to heterozygosity uh, shown here. Now we can also predict how often branches occur in the assembly graph due to repeats. This largely tracks our expectation of which assembly, uh, which genomes are going to be most difficult to assemble. The human genome, which is known to be very repetitive, is up here with the highest repeat-induced branch rate with the oyster genome. The yeast genome, which is very small and easy to assemble, uh, is shown down here. So by plotting where your genome lies on this spectrum from hard to assemble to easy to assemble, it gives you some idea of, of what kind of assembly you're looking at. Uh, this program will also predict the size of the genome, so it'll just take your sequencing read, calculate coverage statistics based on these k-mers, and they make a prediction of what the size of the genome is. So if you want to check that matches uh, what the lab told you, you can. Um, it'll also do more basic quality control, like looking at the mean quality score of each read across uh, the sequencing read. So again, looking at these same six data sets here, we see that the snake genome, the boa constrictor, which was actually sequenced by Illumina, uh, has the highest quality data across the whole read, where the, uh, the Lake Malawi cichlid is the lowest quality data set here. You see a fairly steep drop off of the quality scores towards the three prime end of the read. Um, I showed you this image earlier, which is a per position error rate. Uh, this program will estimate where the errors in your sequencing reads are and plot the error rate as a function of the read length, again, giving you an indication uh, of how clean your data is. Um, and we'll also try to get at this GC bias and whether there's GC bias in your data set. So this is the Lake Malawi cichlid again, um, and it's a 2D histogram where each bin is the KMER coverage for KMERs with a particular GC content. And we see that this is a fairly clean data set where there's not a strong dependency between KMER coverage and GC content. If we look at a yeast data set instead, we see there's a bit of a dependency between uh, GC content and KMER coverage with these higher GC KMERs having uh, somewhat low coverage. Uh, the oyster genome, again, we see two peaks here because of this heterozygosity versus homozygosity KMER problem. Um, the program will also infer the fragment size histogram, just like we saw when we could map from, to a reference genome, but this just does it by looking at where the pairs link up uh, in your assembly graph, and it'll automatically output uh, this, these histograms for you. And finally, it will actually do a simulated assembly. It doesn't do a full assembly because that would take too long, but it'll simulate a genome assembly process, output the length of the contigs that you'd expect to get for a particular KMER size, which will tell you uh, directly how easy or how difficult your genome assembly is going to be. So the yeast data set, which I've said is quite easy, you get the longest contigs across a very uh, wide range of KMERs, this oyster data set, which I'm using to demonstrate how difficult things are, you get very short uh, contigs for pretty much all KMER values. So in the practical session, you're going to look at a report for the data sets we're going to use. Uh, you're not going to generate the report on your own because it takes a little bit too long to generate uh, for the practical session, but the commands used to generate the report are shown here. They're also shown in, uh, in the, the text file for the, for uh, the lab. If you want to read the paper, it's up on archive uh, and the code's available as well. Um, I'll wrap up now. So this was just an overview of how assemblers work, a little bit of theory uh, and more detail on how short and long read assembly pipelines work. Uh, we need different approaches for different types of data. Uh, my standing recommendation is use long reads if you can. Um, and then I just talked about different factors that determine whether an assembly is going to be difficult or easy. Um, I'm here for the rest of the afternoon, so please feel free to ask questions now or during the lab practical. If you think of something after today, uh, feel free to email me. Uh, always happy to help people with assemblies. So do you have any questions at this point? In the back? Yep. Yeah, that's a good question. Um, so the question was about optical mapping. So this, this is a, a technology where you stretch out very long fragments of DNA, and then you can figure out where little markers are on the DNA. So you can't sequence the entire piece, but you can figure out 
cer certain subsequences. Um, a famous one is called BioNano that's used for optical mapping, and that's really useful for building very long scaffolds from your genome assembly. So you, if you have an existing assembly with 100 kb contigs, you can use an optical map to order and orientate those contigs along the optical map to give you much, much longer scaffolds. This is becoming a really popular way of generating complete and nearly finished chromosome arm level assemblies, um, and we're starting to see a lot of that in, in human human assembly as well. Um, since you asked that, I'm going to use this to, to talk about different technologies as well that I didn't get a chance to mention. One that you might hear about is 10x genomics. So 10x genomics is similar to the molecular technology um, that Matthew was just talking about, where it fragments very large pieces of DNA, around 100 kb, and then it barcodes within uh, droplets that all of the reads came from the same source 100 kb molecule and this can be used for scaffolding it can be used for haplotype phasing as well and that's becoming pretty popular in assembly uh, too all right any more questions mm -hmm.